Marty? So you've changed your name to Westland Public Library. Did they make you do it? Is that why you're leaving? <laughs> um, actually, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm just going to become the Zoom administrator for the library. I'm going to sort of, I'm going to change my job a little bit. I saw you walking the other day, and oh, I really? wanted to, I wanted to like stop and wave, and I, and I said to my wife like. I think this is the first time that I've actually seen someone I know walking down the street, like in a but, normal circumstance, you know, like now, like that yeah. often. I wonder if that was with my one of my little humans who yep. uh, he wanted to walk up Hidden Springs and, he, and we got he's three and we got like 40 percent of the way up and then he did not want to do it. So I put him on my shoulders and we went up and then he. Yeah, I don't know. That, that block became melt, Meltdown City. There you go. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, yeah. Well, good seeing you. Uh, yes, good whenever you. I wrote, drove past and virtually. And um, I'm thrilled that uh, we're doing the uh, seminar in a couple of days or webinar in a couple of days. Yeah, yeah. Um, be, it'll be fun. Marty, I'm, I'm Jerry. I'm not just the Westland okay. Public Library. Uh, well, you could be. I, I I am in some fashion, right? And you know what? My husband is going to come on. And, oh, he actually got to be Martin Solberman. Oh, my goodness. He's all, all dressed up conducting a concert here. He looks very good there. Yeah, well, you know, he's a music director for the Beaverton Community Band, and here he is. Okay. I had just assumed that, that those are his typical lounging around the house clothes. Well, you know, sometimes, because I don't have to iron them. You know, he takes those out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Marty, Alex, and I are our neighbors too. We live within shouting distance of each other. Oh, cool! And actually, we're we're friends of Terrence's. Okay. Oh, cool. And his wife. A number of years ago, my wife and I had recruited Terry to the Sustainability Advisory Board. Um, I met him through the Master Recycler class. He's I'm sure you did. Great, great dude. Yeah, he is. And good taste in beer too, which, you know, like that matters to me. He's very much into beer. <laughs> Actually, we have a friend and she's been a master, well, I don't even think she's taken a class in it, but she is the most master recycler sustainability person I have ever met. And she just recently moved here. <laughs> but I mean, she, for eons, there was always a, you know, you had to do it all a certain way. And she, she and she used all of her vegetable um, li liquids to put in other food. And she did, I mean, she's incredible. Oh, you don't have you don't have your uniform on anymore, dear. You first were in there. You were in the tuxedo. You're you're muted. I decided to dress up for this. Yeah, or, or dress down. Who is Westland Public Library? That's Jerry. Does it look uh, like? Yeah, my name is Jerry. I uh, I use the credentials for the library to host this meeting since the sign up or the registrations are through the library. It's not me, right. uh, not me being a jerk. Okay, well I'll call you Jerry. Okay. You can call me Jerry. Dun 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 dun. dun. Here comes Terry now. Hi, kid. Hi. Hi, Terry. 
Oh, the two Martys. Great to see you. Yeah. Yeah, Marty Squared. Yep. That's right. Right. That's the main man, Alex. Debbie. Hi, Debbie. Victoria, are you in, you're at home now. You're not in Brooklyn, are you? I'm leaving tomorrow morning. Okay. Yeah. And there's our administrator, Jerry. Good to see you, Jerry. Greg? Jerry, is this the last time we're going to see you? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm still here. I, 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 I probably should have moved into this building and just saved on rent. Uh, <laughs> Kind of in a better arrangement. Um, my last day contractually is the 31st of August. Um, you know, I'm, we had a meeting last night. We had a meeting on Friday. We have a meeting tonight. I have a meeting on Thursday uh, with, with a lot of you. Um, so I'm, I'm still very much here. OK. Great. Yeah. Well, I'm going to miss you. Right back at you. Oh, it's 7.01. Should we uh, wait another minute to see late arrivals show up? Yeah. Where's uh, 11 people registered? 11. Other than the uh, nine that are here? I don't have No, a actually, list. Marty wasn't registered. Oh, interloper, huh? Yeah, what can I say? It's the only forwarding thing. I think Mike. I don't know if, if my mic is picking it up, or I guess I've been muted, so I guess it wouldn't matter anyway. But uh, oh, you're on. <clears throat> no, I, I was gonna say. Um, so my wife Sarah, who some of you know, are downstairs with. We have three boys, three and under, and I I think there's a war going on. There's something going on downstairs right now that yeah. she's dealing with. So <laughs> thankful for her to. Uh, take it all on herself tonight because that's normally a two two person job to do poorly let alone one how old are the warriors mike uh alex um so Ozzy is three, and then we have twin boys, Cyrus and Paige, who are one. Oh. Oh. Okie doke. Hands full. Yeah, we used to volunteer a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and and then twins happen. You, you will again. Okay, well, uh, uh, Mike, can you hear everybody? I can't see Mike. Uh, what, Edjo? Kim, can you hear us? Mm. Oh, well. Yeah, I can hear That's everybody, me. I think. That's me. I had okay, it on good. mute so I didn't good. disturb you guys. Okay, maybe we should go ahead and get started. I know Alex has a lot to provide. Um, most of you know me, but I'm uh, Terry Shoemaker, co chair of the Western Sustainability Advisory Board. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's uh, education series. Um, Reduce, reuse, and repeat. And even moving beyond that, and Alex is going to tell us how. Um, Alex Mim is sustainability analyst for Clackamas County, and he's a Westland resident of 20 years, 20 years experience in the sustainability field across sectors of government, nonprofit, for-profit, higher education, and community activism. <clears throat> he's also been a past member and chair of the SAB. So. Uh, he is well grounded in what he's going to talk about. So I'm going to turn it over to Alex. So take it away. Thank you. Um, Jerry, could you share or, or whomever um, give me the rights to share my screen? Unless you want me just to act it out. <laughs> or maybe, maybe it's already, let me see actually. Um, you should have gotten co host. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, bear with me as I, so I'm using, um, got it. Hold on, hold on. Yeah, I'm, but I'm using 
Google Slides and Zoom. And so I have to do this weird thing in which I share a portion of my screen so that you all don't have to see my weird rambling notes. Um, is that, can you let me know, is that okay? Are you seeing everything or is actually, let me see if it's cut off a little bit. No, that should be everything. So are you seeing little introduction screen at all? Is that a yes or no? Yeah. I saw it. Yeah, we can okay. see it. Okay. Okay. Cool. So, uh, yeah. I mean, just as Terry said, I have you know been a serving Westland for a long time. Um, in my current job at Clackamas County, I serve workplaces around the county uh, to help them reduce waste, recycle, right, uh, compost, and just adopt a wide range of green practices. But in our team's work at the county, is definitely the the bread and butter is definitely around recycling, but uh, we also do some cool things around climate uh, and climate action. And uh, this, honestly, you all are kind of some, I don't wanna say guinea pigs, but like lab rats maybe in which, so a lot of these ideas, uh, I mean, none of this information or data stuff that I've, I'm, you know, generating myself, but there's a lot of good research and it seems like a lot of good, interesting points um, that I think could be tied together to talk about you know, why it's great to recycle, but why we need to stop treating recycling as the be all end all of environmental uh, practices, or at least the green standard by which we kind of look through or a lens we look through uh, for everything else. So you have my contact information is here. You can always get my contact info through Terry. Um, I'm always happy to, to chat about this. So the stuff I wanna talk about today, one is just to kind of go over the recycling rules for the greater more, greater Portland metro region. Uh, I'm gonna to try to do that lightning round style, uh, then move on to talk about some of the benefits of recycling and uh, some great improvements coming to the state of Oregon. Then I wanna get into uh, some of recycling's limitations and again, some of its overhyped benefits. Uh, and then talk about why we need to start uh, everything from a climate perspective first, even when we're talking about whether it is actually always good to recycle everything. Uh, and then time permitting, have some resources and tips to send to send you all off. Um, so this is, I, I have a lot of slides and this is the first time I'll be talking about a lot of this stuff. So if I start skipping around, it's probably because I'm looking at the clock. Um, so again, we're just going to start with the basic curbside recycling how to's because there's still a lot of confusion out there. Um, and it's something that we want to make sure that people are, are doing right. So when I say curbside recycling, I'm referring to the recycling that's picked up by our franchise collectors So at home here and it'd be Westland refuse and recycling. Um, but the, you know, you might go to work somewhere else in the Portland metro. Portland metro region and what's great is that the list is the same throughout the metro region. So most of Clackamas County, Washington County and Multnomah County, the list is the same. And uh, the five basic categories are mixed paper, cardboard and cartons, really specific plastic containers, metals, and then separately gl uh, glass bottles and jars. And I'll provide some examples uh, for each of those as well as some items that commonly uh, trip people up. A question that comes up in every presentation, I'm just going to get it out of the way first, um, is I'm going to talk about giving items a rinse, like giving containers a rinse. And people will say, well, how clean? My grandma has more than once proudly told me that she runs her recycling through the dishwasher. And I've told her, grandma, you don't need to do that. But please keep sending me $10 on my birthday. I'm really counting on that 10 bucks. No, so just um, you your recycling doesn't, doesn't need to be spotless. Typically just a good quick rinse is fine. The most extreme example is typically peanut butter in which you can just put some water in it, let it sit overnight, dump it out, give it one more rinse and it's good to go. You don't need to scrub or soap or anything, uh, but oil and food waste can ruin loads of recycling. So we wanna get the worst stuff out. So let's start with mixed paper. Uh, Making content or making items with recycled content compared to virgin paper saves about 40% of the energy. Uh, and what we're looking for here, it's pretty simple. I mean, it's printer paper, mail, envelopes, magazines, catalogs, newspapers, paper bags, 
notebooks and the like, it's okay to put paper in that has uh, staples or paper clips or the little plastic window on uh, envelopes or even the spiral binding. Those, those things will get filtered out of paper mill, um, but they're gonna go as trash. So if you can remove them, great, but you don't really need to. Next is uh, cardboard and paperboard. So if you think of a corrugated cardboard box, you get a shipment in or paperboard, you know, things like the egg cartons, tissue boxes, cereal boxes and the tubes that paper towel and toilet paper come in. And then in our region, we can also recycle cartons and Tetra Pak containers. Um, these are paperboard materials that then have a coating or a liner on the inside. And these go to a special facility that can separate that paper out from that stuff uh, and then recycle it just fine. Again, give it a rinse, uh, but otherwise it's good to go. And then the caps have to on those little uh, cartons have to be tossed. Those are, are garbage. Speaking of garbage, uh, the common contaminants that we'll see people putting in the recycling are things like frozen food boxes, uh, takeout containers, coffee cups, paper plates, um, and even a lot of the reams that go around printer paper are not, are not actually recyclable. That's because all these items are made with, with plastics that help them not degrade uh, when they get wet or with the, if they have to stay up to extreme heat or extreme cold. So this, these paper fibers, they're either mixed in or they're coated with plastic, kind of a Frankenstein material, but that plastic is what gives it its capacity to, to withstand being uh, holding water or or again, the extreme heat of a coffee cup or, or resisting freezer burn. But when these materials go to a paper mill, they don't break down into pulp. It has become a weird boogery mess that has to be sorted out. Uh, you, some paper ream or copy paper reams are starting to be made without that wet strength, that liner. Um, and some frozen food boxes are starting to be, to be made that way. Either way, you know whether they have food on them or they look clean to you, they're still garbage. And uh, if you're wondering why these, just look back up, why these are garbage, but these aren't, it's because this is the, the way that these are coated, that paper underneath is still just pure paper. Right? Whereas these things, again, they're kind of this hybrid paper plastic blend. Also garbage are paper towels and tissues, whether they're clean or dirty. This is basically paper's last stand. So this material, it's soft, it's absorbent, and uh, they are so soft that they can't withstand the, the recycling process. Uh, but it's really good to buy recycled content of these because this is exactly where your recycled content paper will typically go. Next category uh, is plastics. And this is where we, by far there's the most confusion and there's been such a pr proliferation of plastics in our lives. It's no surprise. We get a lot of questions uh, from people saying, hey, I see these this recycle symbol on the bottom of this plastic item uh, with a number inside, which numbers can we recycle? And to recycle right, you have to ignore the numbers. Now those numbers absolutely do matter, but what those numbers are, are is a code from the plastics industry that just identifies what general type of plastic it is. It doesn't tell you whether something can actually be recycled because there are a lot, if we just said ones, twos, and fives, then there would be a lot of items that cannot be sorted or are just, just impossible to deal with that are actually made of those, those materials. So instead of getting caught up on the numbers, we really go by the size and shape of the, of the container. And there are five basic shapes. Now making uh, plastic with recycled content versus virgin saves about 30% of the energy. Um, the shapes and the containers that we're looking for are, and I'll do examples of all of these, bottles and jugs, uh, dairy style tubs, buckets, and planter pots. The lids and the caps that come with these things are trash. Even if they're made of the same material, they're trash because ultimately these items are gonna wind up getting crushed and those caps are, they're gonna wind up getting separated. They're gonna go in with paper and cardboard. So small plastic caps cannot go in your mixed recycling. When we say bottles and jugs, we're looking for six ounces or larger with a threaded neck. Um, again, give it a good rinse and trash the cap. Some of these criteria of like, it sounds like it's gotta be on a Tuesday when the moon is full. It just, it sounds like a lot, but realistically it just comes down to how these materials are manufactured and 
which plastics are used for which manufacturing processes. So if you look at bottles with a threaded neck and how they're made, you would realize, okay, this is by sorting this out, this is going to be the same type of resin that we can use for other things. So six ounces or larger threaded neck. If you think of soda bottles, you know, soap bottles, shampoo, milk jugs, uh, salad dressing containers, six ounces or larger with a threaded neck, it's good to go. Just give it a rinse. Round tubs, we're really kind of looking at the dairy style. Um, again, six ounces or larger. There's a lot of yogurt, single use yogurt containers that are smaller now. Um, they, they need to be large enough to, for one, actually be worth it, but also to even just be able to be sorted properly. They do need to be round, uh, which for a long time I was putting tofu containers in the recycling and, that, and those, they're, they're technically recyclable, but they're, they're not sortable easily at all. Again, empty and clean them and trash the lid. So you want them to kind of, these typically you'll, they'll feel kind of rigid. There's a lot of kind of to-go containers and deli style containers that are perfectly fine. If they're six ounces or larger, put them in. Buckets, you wouldn't do this too often, but five gallons or smaller. Um, if you have a, a bucket with two inches of dried paint in the bottom, that can't be recycled. Um, it's got to be got to give the stuff a good rinse. Um, you do have to trash the lid because, again, a flat item like that is not going to be sorted properly at a, at a material recovery facility. Uh, and you're, it's fine to leave on the metal handles. Those if you can remove them, great. But those metal handles are going to be removed regardless. And the last item are plastic planter pots. Um, more and more when you buy stuff from a gardening center, they'll come in these pots that are really thin and crinkly. Those types are not recyclable. That, that material, that's just meant to be cut and disposed of. That, that material is just way too thin to be able to kind of make it through uh, the recycling process properly. We're really looking for the rigid style, uh, four, four inches or larger in diameter and give them a rinse. So if they're filled with dirt, that's a problem, but they don't have to be spotless. So for your curbside recycling, there's a, there again, there are, we'll talk about this in a bit. There are other options for plastic recycling, but when it comes to curbside, that's it. Bottles, jugs, bottles and jugs that are six ounces or larger with a threaded neck, uh, round tubs, six ounces or larger, buckets, five gallons or smaller, pots, four inches or large, four inches or larger. So what does that exclude? basically the ocean of plastic that, that we get in our everyday lives for the most part. If it's not shaped like one of those, it cannot go in your curbside recycling. If you think about how much pack, like clam style, style pack, or clam shell style packaging we get items in, or, or items that food come in, or even, you know, sometimes people are confused about things like, um, well, in this case, a cup, because it looks like a tub. That's a, an example in which the resin matters and also just kind of how durable or flimsy the material is. Um, I've put an asterisk next to um, the plastic bag and that uh, that uh, the bubble envelope mailer, whatever it's called, uh, because if you're not going to give the go the extra step to bring it to a store for recycling, um, it needs to be garbage. So if you want to if you want to recycle these things, um, there are Drop, there are boxes available at a lot of the big box stores like Fred Meyer, Safeway, Home Depot. Um, these are pretty easy just to kind of, you know, store up and then bring somewhere. But, but they are the single biggest problem in our recycling system. That's partly why, or it's the main reason of why the state banned plastic bags. I mean, technically, if you look at, which we'll talk about in a bit, if you look at the environmental impacts of a plastic bag, that is used uh, that is used and then put in the garbage or a paper bag that is then recycled. That plastic bag has significantly lower environmental impacts as long as it's disposed of properly. The point of the of the or the plastic bag ban is not to drive people towards paper bags. It's to drive them towards reusable bags. And one of the big reasons is because plastic bags still wind up in our recycling. They gum up the machines. They impact the machine's capacity to sort. Uh, and they just make everything more expensive. So at a re here in you know Westland, our collector has their own material recovery facility. They are sorting materials for lots of recyclers around the region. And they have to shut down their machines multiple times a day so that people can climb into these gears with big blades, cut out the bags until the machines can run properly again. So these are great to recycle. If you bring the stuff to a store, it's going to get 
mostly recycled into Trex, the composite decking material. It's a great thing to do, um, but if you're, if you're not gonna nerd out and do that, just put it in the garbage. Also garbage is any bioplastic that's labeled as compostable or biodegradable. So these materials, which uh, there's, there's a lot of slides. There's a slide on this too. Uh, these things are way worse for the environment from a climate perspective. Um, and they also are not, you can't recycle them. I mean, for one, they're not even made of the petroleum products that we're looking to recycle, but they're designed to break down, which is exactly what you don't want a new product to do. These also, by the way, cannot be composted in your, in your backyard bin or in cities that have curbside composting or at a business. These also cannot go in. These are just garbage. Next up is uh, mixed metals. So if there's anything to be gung-ho about recycling and going above and beyond with, it's metals. So to recycle steel saves about 74% of the energy and recycling aluminum saves about 95% of the energy compared to uh, using new materials. And this is stuff like can, you know, cans that you might get superfood in. Um, that's soup or food, not superfood. I guess both. Uh, soda cans, aluminum foil, foil pans, paint cans if they're empty. Uh, and as we'll talk next, uh, some aerosol cans as well. The main thing you kind of want to look for is that they can't be covered in food residue. So the, the big example is like if you make a pan of lasagna and it's just caked in burnt cheese and sauce, that's garbage. But other stuff, give it a rinse and, and put it in. So for aerosols, um, spray cans that help chemicals, they're fine to recycle as long as they're both totally empty. So if you press the button, there's no more hiss they're not under pressure anymore and that they're not labeled as poisonous. If they're, if they're still under pressure, no matter what it is, or if it's labeled as poisonous, that's hazardous waste that has to be brought to a hazardous waste facility. If you wanna recycle these, leave the little spray nozzle on, but toss the bigger cap in the garbage. Now we talked about um, the value of of recycling metal. And so there's a lot of small pieces that still have value, but if you just toss them into mixed recycling, they're not gonna get sorted properly. They're gonna get lost in the shuffle. So these are things like bottle caps and jar lids. What you can do is just take a metal can and then just fill that up. And it doesn't matter if, whether it's ferrous or non-ferrous. So basically steel or aluminum, whatever, if it's metal, I mean, paper clips, busted binder clips, whatever it is, just fill that can. And then when it's full, either tape that down or or just squeeze it and crimp it down and then toss that can into the recycling and then all that metal in that can is going to absolutely uh, get recycled. And you know the, the benefits or the energy savings of recycling metal is so great that if you look at the numbers behind it, we in our region could take all of our metal recycling and put it on a barge in the port of Portland, send it down uh, the Columbia to the Pacific Coast, send it down the Pacific Coast to the Panama Canal, through the Panama Canal to Cape Canaveral, Florida, put it on a space shuttle, send it to the moon, recycle it in some theoretical moon recycling facility, send it back to earth the same way to then be made into new products. And that would still save more energy than just mining and refining new metal. If there's any, people get hung up on going crazy about recycling styrofoam or some plastics and some of that stuff is good to do. But if there's anything to be adamant about taking the time to recycle every little bit, it's metal. From an environmental and climate perspective, it's absolutely metal. And then the last material in their own bin are glass bottles and jars. So glass that's used to package food and drinks can be recycled. It's not ceramic or it's not tempered. Uh, we always keep glass in a separate bin here. There's some cities that have, uh, or other areas that have glass in the mix recycling. It really is better to keep this separate, not just from a uh, worker safety standpoint, but big surprise, glass breaks. And when you have a lot of broken glass in your recycling, it can not only, it can not only contaminate that recycling, but also can really damage the machinery as well. Uh, the best thing that you can do if for deposit style containers is to collect them and bring them to a place like Bottle Drop. Uh, that's best for our local system, but if you still want to put, you know, your your deposit containers that are made of glass in your curbside bin, totally cool. They're they're definitely going to get recycled. 
items that cannot ever go in your curbside recycling are basically uh, tempered dishware, like glassware or ceramic. So this is not only does this have a different, uh, is made up of a different composite of glass, but they have different melting points. And if these get in your mixed recycling and they get into a, a, a load of glass recycling, they can, can, they can ruin that whole load of glass recycling. So if it's usable, donate it, or if it's broken, you know, put it into a small box or a bunch of bags, whatever, just for safety and put it in the garbage. There are obviously a ton of other materials that we have to deal with at home and things like electronics, hazardous waste, um, a lot of questions about batteries and it, CFL or fluorescent bulbs, if you have those. Uh, we have a really awesome resource in the region uh, hosted by Metro. It's the Find a Recycler uh, service. So there's a hotline that you can call six days a week, 503-234-3000 and talk to a live person about what you have and how you want to get rid of it. Um, or they have a searchable database online. What's great about them is that they, for one, they get the most current information on who is taking what whether those prices, what those prices are, but they can also help you find not just recycling options, but reuse and, and donation options. Um, I use this all the time for work. I've used it all the time. Personally, this is a great service that our, re our region has. Um, I would definitely, yeah. I mean, again, if you have anything, I mean, you're moving and you have a bunch of bulky furniture, you can obviously turn around and sell that. But if you want to donate, they're going to have the best information on that as well. And then another strong recommendation is that for you, for others in your home, um, is to get yourself some recycling guides. Um, you can go to uh, Clackamas County's website, clackamas.us slash recycling and print out any number. There's recycle guides in different languages as well. There are some for a single use family or single use home versus kind of multifamily slash apartment and for workplaces as well. Again, I work for Clackamas County. I work with businesses on, on recycling. We have a whole bunch of other awesome resources as well. Um, but if people don't have signage to refer to, research shows that people overwhelmingly think it's better to put an item in the recycling if they're not sure rather than in the garbage because they're so concerned that missing out on the opportunity to recycle every little thing is they're so concerned that missing out on that is a big deal that they will wind up contaminating recycling. So having educational signage available for people is super important. So one little quick myth about recycling. We hear it a lot that people always say for items that you know, at least it's not taking up space in a landfill, or at least this item breaks down in a landfill. So we hear that about compostable materials and things like that. Now there are, you can find, examples in history of in which landfill space was an issue. Landfill space is absolutely not an issue now. It is absolutely not an issue here. Landfills exist for a good reason because there are some items that we should send there. In theory, you could recycle just about everything. That doesn't mean that you should recycle just about everything. Landfills are here, they're, they're really well managed. Um, and in theory, or not in theory, in reality, items that go to the landfill and then break down, we're really talking about kind of organic material. What that really means is that they're just releasing methane and methane released from landfills is one of the biggest sources of methane uh, emissions in the world. So we really, we don't want things to break down the landfill. We want to, we want to recycle and compost what, what's good to recycle and compost. And then we want to send other items to the landfill. When, when our landfill eventually runs out of space, all we're going to do is make another landfill. It's not a thing to get hung up on. So shifting gears, I mean, if you have questions about some items, maybe if we could say that for the end, because there's a lot that I think, hopefully the conversation kind of moves past just the recycling do's and don'ts. So just a little bit um, about the benefits uh, of recycling and some improvements that are coming to our state. For one, I mean, recycling, it's an awesome, it's a valuable thing to do. It is a net benefit in every single way. Compared to, compared to sending our materials to a landfill, Recycling creates jobs locally and globally. It saves us money as consumers because uh, builders and manufacturers have another low cost option for feedstock. 
Uh, you have businesses saving money on their disposal costs. It conserves energy and water. It reduces other uh, demand for natural resources. Um, it protects habitat and, and wildlife. It's a, it's a reliable uh, way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and it reduces pollution overall. Recycling is a net benefit. There are limits to its benefit, but it is absolutely something to do. And being good about curbside recycling is definitely something that we all should strive for. In Oregon is really awesome at recycling. So we recycle about half of our waste, which probably means nothing to you all, but compared to other states, that's really good. Um, we were the first state with a bottle bill in which our deposit containers are being collected uh, that was initially created to reduce litter, but we also see how much that improves recycling rates overall. We passed the Right to Recycle Act back in 1991. We have our paint care program and our e-cycles program uh, in which producers and users and retailers are responsible for making sure that hazardous materials are kept out of our, out of our landfills and aren't dumped illegally. And then what I'm gonna talk about next is uh, last year we passed the Plastic Pollution and Recycling Modernization Act, which is a mouthful, uh, but is just basically a way to make the improvements in our, in our recycling system that need to be made. We also have requirements at the state level for putting the materials to their highest best use. Uh, and we prioritize materials management, not just solid waste management. So there's a lot of policies and laws written about keeping items out of a landfill. And that is not always the scientifically best thing to do. There are times in which you can, you can write a law to, to expand composting and increase greenhouse gas emissions by doing so. That's not how Oregon operates. And org, there's, if you look at, if you're in the nerdy world of recycling and sustainability, you'll see people from Oregon speaking nationally and internationally about all sorts of topics. We're recognized for our efforts. Um, it's a good place to be when it comes to, if you are passionate about sustainability and about recycling, Oregon and the way that Oregon uh, and DEQ and other governments work on this stuff, it's the way that it should be done. I'm gonna try to breeze through this, but the Plastic Pollution and Recycling Modernization Act, AKA Senate Bill 582B was passed last year. Um, there it's, um, what we've seen is that over time, recycling rates and contamination rates have basically plateaued no matter how much education and outreach is done. Um, and so it's become clear that our system needs a pretty significant overhaul and a, a much bigger investment in it. Now this act actually has uh, five components to it, each of which is a massive project within itself. Um, so first up is to have one consistent recyclables list for the entire state. So not only is this gonna cut down on confusion for people, but also when we all have the same materials and we can all pool, all, pool our recyclables together, that opens up our access to uh, better and improved markets as well. So we're gonna see our options for recycling overseas and domestic only go up by combining every, everyone's recyclables together instead of having this collector work with this collector and with, or with this manufacturer and this recycler with this manufacturer, et cetera, et cetera. We also uh, have a piece in it for extended producer responsibility. Now this is not necessarily anything new in the world of hazardous waste, but it is in terms of recycling. So obviously when you buy an item, that manufacturer or that company they're not just selling you the item. They're also selling you that annoying packaging that came with it. And what this EPR is doing is, is holding manufacturers responsible for their, for their uh, part in how much plastic waste or how much waste in general we are now dealing with. So they, they are, when they sell you that item, that packaging, those costs are being borne by us to deal with. Um, and so now manufacturers are going to pay into a system uh, that will help other that will help recycling programs and they also have to be involved with helping customers to recycle hard recycle items so for things of like for example taking items back for recycling um, there's a this is kind of a big thing this is to no surprise why there was a lot of lobbying against this bill because it's going to cost some companies some money um, but it's a really good thing to do Next up is a truth and labeling task force uh, because there are not there are no laws stating that a company can't put on their packaging recyclable 
Um, all the, if something is marked or if a package is marked as recyclable, it just has to be recyclable somewhere, somewhere. So something could be recyclable in New York and we'll get that packaging here they'll say recyclable. Or if you think of, again, like the chasing arrows on plastics, you know, again, that was put there from uh, as a thing with the plastics industry, it confuses everyone. And that became a requirement. So removing that requirement so that our plastics no longer have those chasing arrow symbols confusing everyone, no longer having misleading claims on packaging. Um, this work, work is going to be pretty awesome. And we're going to see a lot of states working together with us on this. There's also going to be increasing services to multifamily communities like apartments and condos and rural communities because they simply do not get the same uh, services that we might get as single single family home owners. I mean, bulky waste and I mean glass recycling, even recycling in general is not always guaranteed. So all of these things are expected to increase recycling by 17% and have a bunch of other environmental impact or environmental benefits. They're not coming online until 2025, which obviously is three years from now, but all of these things, there's a lot of planning and a lot of sorting out that needs to go into these things. So, Moving on to some of the limits of, of recycling. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, we're looking at the time. I'm gonna have to speed this up. So some things that, uh, there are some environmental problems out there that people think of, or, or that we should be concerned about and that people think that recycling is a good way to, to address them. Um, but again, the benefits of recycling are oftentimes overhyped. And so I'm just gonna use three quick examples. So first is, Recycling is not a good tool for reducing plastic marine debris. Now, the, the amount of plastic in our oceans is an environmental crisis. I don't need to tell you all about it, but it is killing wildlife. It is killing off ecosystems. Plastics are spreading throughout the food web. You have microplastics that are in our oceans that are showing up in every, every level of organisms, including humans. Plastics in the ocean take centuries to break, to break down. Um, and you hear all the time about the massive uh, gyres of plastic out in the ocean, like the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is, its name is capitalized. That's how, that's how major it is. And if you look at the countries that, uh, who generates the most plastic waste, the US is second. Now this data is from 2010 in which, but even now we generate about 40 million tons of plastic waste. I'm not saying this, we send 40 million tons of plastic waste to the ocean, but as a country, we generate 40 million tons of plastic waste. We generate the second most in the world behind China. So you, you would, you can understand why someone would think that the US is responsible for a lot of the plastic in the ocean. But if you actually look at where the stuff is coming from, we do a really good job at actually managing our waste properly. We have well-run landfills. We're not putting our, for the most part, we're not burying our garbage or burning it or just dumping it into rivers. So it's estimated that less than 0.35% of the plastics in the ocean actually comes from the US, which obviously that's too much already. We need to be addressing even that, but, but we don't have a lot of plastic in the ocean in which recycling is going to, that recycling could help uh, address. If you look at in the, in the marine debris back in 2010, the, the whole world generated 275 million tons of plastic waste, 8 million tons of that or about 2.9% went up in the ocean. But the majority of that comes from originally being dumped in rivers and low and middle come low and middle income nations. So the Philippines, for example, it's an island nation of over 7,000 islands. They're all small. People are all living by the coast. They don't have a lot of landfills. So they emit more than a third of all the plastic waste in, into the ocean because they have nowhere else to put it. And if Europe and the US stopped using all of our plastics, the amount of mismanaged plastic in the world, not even in the ocean, just mismanaged plastic, wherever it goes, would drop by less than 5%. So addressing plastic use in the US and Europe doesn't have a, as big of an impact as you might expect. And the last point that recycling doesn't keep uh, plastic waste out of oceans, landfills do. Having more landfills and better landfills around the world could actually keep plastic out of the ocean. Secondly, recycling doesn't help us make better choices as 
consumers. And the data behind this is a study that Oregon DEQ did back in 2018. It was their environmental attribute study. And it was a, a meta study of scientific literature that looked at 71 distinct studies with over 5,000 different comparisons of materials. And the point behind this was to basically figure out packaging that is packaging and food service wear that is either recyclable or made of recycled content or compostable, biodegradable, or is bio-based. How do those impact, how do those attributes compare to others for the same thing? So if you're looking at um, a clamshell container for food that's made of recycled content versus made of virgin plastic, or a cup that's made of compostable plastic versus a plastic cup. And DEQ, they didn't do studies on themselves. They looked at the reliable scientific literature that was already out there. And the impacts that they, they looked at were the climate impacts of the different materials, largely the fossil fuel use, fossil fuel use, also the natural resources that went into that stuff, like how much water and minerals were, uh, were depleted, and then how much pollution it created. So ecotoxicity, um, smog, acidification of the ocean, et cetera. So climate impact, resource degradation, and pollution generation. Some of the key takeaways, the big one is that these buzzwords are not at all a reliable predictor of environmental benefit. And making decisions based on whether something is recyclable or recycled content or compostable is as likely to do more harm than good. So an example is that uh, non-recyclable materials compared to recyclable tend to have lower impacts more than half the time, meaning you are more likely to make the better environmental choice choosing a package that is not recyclable than recyclable because of, and the reason behind that is because of how often those non-recyclable items are made of really lightweight plastic that doesn't require a lot of resources and doesn't, doesn't cause a lot of weight during shipping. So a big takeaway is that we as consumers cannot at all make any sort of accurate guess about the environmental impact of one type of food service wear or package over another. So if you are choosing one type of food because it comes in a glass jar versus plastic, well, I guess, I mean, in that case, you might be concerned about leaching or things like that. But generally speaking, picking something based on what we can do with the packaging is not at all the way to do it. Really what matters most is packaging that that best preserves the product itself because the product inside that packaging has a way, 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 way bigger environmental impact than the packaging itself. So packaging that preserves food longer but is not recyclable is better environmentally than a recyclable package that exposes that food to more air and allows the food to go bad sooner. So essentially, we get hung up on packaging because it's just with us all the time. And we really need to emphasize the packaging itself. Just a quick example, you can buy coffee in three different containers. You have a, a, a top, a steel container with a plastic lid, recyclable everywhere. Second one is, is a plastic tub, recyclable virtually anywhere. And then the last one is kind of this plastic metal laminate, a flexible pouch that is not recyclable anywhere. And you would think, okay, the one that has to go in the landfill is going to be the worst. But in fact, if you look at the energy required to make them, the associated greenhouse gas emissions, the amount of waste that is generated in their production and then in their disposal, that single-use plastic flexible pouch that we all hate to get is actually the best thing. It's lightweight. It doesn't take a lot to make it. The endlessly recyclable steel can is arguably the worst. Another quick example, Chobani yogurt got a lot of good press of its own making because it said that plastic is, is a problem. We're going to start selling some of our yogurt in a paper cup instead of plastic. The problem, which only I only found one article that actually mentioned this, is that this paper style container with, with a liner, the thin plastic liner on it is worse than plastic when, it, when you're talking about greenhouse gas emissions, you're talking about the amount of oil that it requires, the amount of water that it requires, the amount of energy that it requires, the amount of pollution that it takes to create it. As long as you are putting, even if you are th throwing a, yogurt, a plastic yogurt container away, it is still overall an environmentally better product than this. But 
Another thing I didn't see in any of the articles, one good benefit is that this is made with, it's plant-based oat milk rather than dairy. That is an environmental win. And that's something to be touting. Not this paper cup, which is, it's greenwashing. That's all it is. It's, it's them getting themselves some good PR for something because everybody knows that plastic pollution is a problem. When in fact, this is worse. Uh, just real quick, other highlights, compostable plastics have more fossil fuel inputs than virgin plastic, create more greenhouse gas emissions and more pollution than plastic. So the compostable stuff that, that people love to use for being sustainable is worse. The only good thing that you could probably look for is that if you're looking to for an item made of the same exact material, so let's say you're looking for, you're comparing paper plates to paper plates or paper to paper, that material being made with recycled content uh, material is very likely better compared to, to be made with not recycled content. I said that so horribly. If you're comparing the same material and it's made with recycled content, that's probably better. But if you're comparing, say, recycled content paper versus plastic, you have there's no comparison. You can't, you have no way to actually discern what's usable. The last piece is that recycling is not a good tool for fighting the, the climate crisis. The past eight years have been the hottest eight years on record since 1880. Last year, we had multiple instances of record heat and significantly higher average, higher than average temperatures across the globe. You can see on the map on the right where that happened, basically everywhere except for some spots in the Pacific Ocean. And 19 of the 20, 19 of the 20 hottest years on record are in the past two decades. We are clearly living within the climate crisis. And here locally, we are, we are already impacted. That extreme heat wave that we had last June was the single most anomalous extreme heat event ever observed on earth in two centuries since we started taking these records. We lived through the craziest heat wave in, in two centuries on earth. That's here. The ice storm last February that put a big old tree on top of my house, that was caused by the warming of the Arctic and sending in the polar vortex way south to Oregon, even all the way down to Texas. The wildfire smoke that we are now experiencing as just a thing in the summer. And then just this past weekend, um, another atmospheric river of water that has evaporated from the Pacific Ocean coming in and, and dumping massive amounts of rain on our region. All of these things are impacts of the climate crisis. A little bit of a downer slide, but we're looking at what we are on track for right now is a third of the people around the earth having to live with extreme heat conditions uh, as a way of life. Over a billion people needing to leave where they live by 2050. We're looking at the risk of the extinction of half of the land-based species, losing 10% of our global economy just to the damage of cl the climate crisis every year. More wildfires, worse droughts, bigger, more, worse tropical storms, the Arctic Ocean losing ice in mid-century, and to top it all off, a bunch of gnarly diseases and insects as things get hotter too. So if you look at our greenhouse gas emissions that we put out as a country, in order to avoid those types of impacts, what our part is that we need to reduce our emissions by about 90%. And if we decided that we were going to fundamentally shift and restructure society so that we recycled, we became a zero waste society, a zero waste society in which we recycle and compost virtually everything, meaning you don't have curbside garbage service anymore. Businesses don't have curbside garbage service. We're talking about a fundamentally different world of what we know. We would reduce our country's emissions by 3%. This gets us, it is, gets us nowhere close and for the effort that that would take it's, it's not worth going to such extremes to, with recycling for purely the climate benefit. Recycling is worth doing from a climate perspective, but its ceiling for what it can really do for climate is really low. And that's because if you look at the greenhouse gas emiss emissions associated with the things that we buy, if you look at the extraction and the refining of that material, manufacturing into a product, shipping it to retailers, retailers storing it, then selling it to us. By the time that we have it and we have to decide whether we want to send that item to the landfill or to recycle it or to compost it, 
99% of that item's associated greenhouse gas emissions have already occurred. Before we ever own it, 99% of the emissions associated with it have already occurred. Recycling cannot, it's a good thing to do, but it cannot get us where we need to go. So as a comparison, you gotta love the onion, um, but a 3% reduction is the equivalent of the Titanic, which was traveling at about 25 miles per hour when it hit that iceberg, slowing down to 24 and a quarter miles per hour. Yes, it, it's recycling is good and we need it, we need more of it, but it absolutely cannot get us where we need to go. And dollar for dollar, it is absolutely not a big chunk. But again, people get hung up on it. When they, when they learn what more they can recycle, oftentimes the next thing they wanna do is find out what else they can recycle. And to take JFK's quote, ask not what more you can recycle, but ask what more than recycling you can do. So what we should be doing is prioritizing practices from a climate perspective. Globally, we put out about 50 gigatons of CO2 equivalent each year. Uh, the US, we put out 5.8 gigatons a year. And if you're wondering, China is about twice us, but we put out 5.8. And to limit warming from, from to limit warming to 1.5, degrees Celsius, which is the agreed upon absolute limit to avoid. It still means accepting that things are going to get worse. It's just about avoiding catastrophic results. We have to cut our emissions in half by 2030, which is seven and a half years away, and be net zero by 2050. Now, if you look at the emissions gap, which is basically the difference between where we're headed for 2030, if things stay as they are versus where we need to be, we're talking about 32 gigatons of of CO2 equivalent. Now, you a gigaton, I had to look up just to visualize it. A gigaton is 1 billion metric tons, which is roughly the mass of all land mammals, excluding humans, or the size of about 200 million elephants. So apparently enough elephants to stretch from earth to the moon. So that's one gigaton. We are putting out 50 of those every year. Now, we can't just purely say that we need to reduce our emissions because when you're really talking about uh, climate action, you're really talking about two things. One is reducing the amount of greenhouse gases that we're putting out into the atmosphere, so reducing our sources, but then also increasing the Earth's capacity to absorb that or to sequester that, basically improving carbon sinks. So this chart just shows uh, the major sources of emissions on the left going into the atmosphere, about 60% of it staying up there in the atmosphere uh, and about 40% uh, is being reabsorbed by earth. So we can't just say really that we have to reduce emissions because it's about reducing emissions and improving sinks at the same time. Um, and if you, the probably the best information on what we can do for climate is through Project Drawdown. You can go to their drawdown.org. Um, this is, Drawdown, I mean, it's, it just basically lays out climate solutions according to their, uh, to their capacity for reduction or, or sequestration. Um, and I'll show you some examples. It, it's talking about if we as a world got together and did what we needed to do for all these different things, how much of a, of a climate impact does that have? And it ranks them according to two different scenarios. One is to limit global warming by uh, the two degrees, which would still be, which would actually be catastrophic. And all the research shows that we should not be aiming for a two degree warming. We really should be aiming for 1.5. Experts uh, in, in a lot of different fields, including from Oregon, got together, got together and, and continually update the information on what are the actual climate impacts of what we're doing and what are, what would be the impacts of various solutions. Now, obviously, if we're talking globally, it's not a perfect comparison to here, to West Lynn, but it, the themes hold true and the practices still hold true. So actually, if I could back up, um, can you see this screen? I'm on another website now. Can you see this real quick? Yay, yay. So this is kind of what their table of solutions looks like, in which you're looking at what would it be if we radically invested in onshore wind turbines? And you can click on them and get a lot of information on what that means. And what are the climate uh, benefit? Again, we want to be looking at scenario two because that's what we need to be looking at. 
So if you look at these items, a lot of them, we as individuals have no control over. There's a lot of land use things. There's a lot of things overseas that we can't control. Uh, but there are a lot of practices on here that we can do personally. So I went through and I looked at the different items. Now on the right, you see a chart of some of the practices that they looked at. Recycling is way down there. I believe it's number 40. I have to look it up. It's either 40 something or 60 something on the list. I think, I think it's 40, around 48. Um, it is, oh, I just had it anyway. Recycling is nowhere near the top. But if you look at the things that we as individuals can do, really so, uh, buying renewable power, supporting renewable power, reducing food waste, uh, eating plant-rich diets. Distributed solar is basically having solar panels, or like a whether a personal or a community solar project. Other renewables, choosing public transit, insulation, yada, yada, yada. You can read it for yourself. But recycling is way down the list. And if you look at recycling's capacity for addressing the climate change, once again, it shows that compared to so many other things that we can do, it is a small fraction. And too many people get hung up on it. And just for curiosity's sake, I also put composting in. They're about, in the ranking system, they're about the same. So composting can help. It's good to do. It's not going to blow the doors off. Um, I have five minutes. So I'm just going to blow through this. We do have hope if we act now. And a lot of the research is showing the Earth's capacity to respond well. So, for example, they used to think that the time between us reaching carbon neutrality and the and the climate actually climate change reversing uh, would be decades. And now what they're what they're seeing is that it's really more like three to five years. So if we make it happen, we start seeing the benefits virtually right away. The problem is that as we continue to delay install and not do anything, we keep crossing these tipping points uh, in which there's no turning back. And we and the earth cannot respond as well. So if you talk about when you are counting on Arctic ice being there to help reflect heat and that Arctic ice melts, then we've just impacted the earth's capacity uh, to respond. So I'm gonna just skip ahead because I'm out of time. But uh, some tips, so one, a couple of them. So one is, I mean, go to Drawdown, look at it, but they have uh, just a free series of videos called Climate Solutions 101. You can get to them in a couple of hours. And it just kind of gives you an overview of climate and the science behind it and things that we can do. It just really kind of breaks down Drawdown for you. The Climate Reality Leadership Corps, if you want to hear Al Gore talk about climate and present on it, he actually does a pretty good job. Um, that's a really good one. The Climate Reality Leadership Corps, again, it's free. It's basically over the course of two weekends. You watch a lot of videos. You have some conversations. You learn about where we are climate. And so the whole point of these things is to have people who are not well-versed in climate learning enough to be able to advocate for climate action. That's their purpose. So if you feel like, oh, I can't do this, these courses are literally made for you. Also right now in Clackamas County, uh, we are developing a climate action plan. We'll see what the electeds think of it, but either way, we have a, a survey out there right now. It is, I'm begging you, it is super important, not just to me, but for climate action in Clackamas County, for you to go to the survey and let the elected officials know what matters to you in climate action and how you're being impacted by climate. And the city of West Lynn is a great partner in this. We've been having conversations with them about uh, working together and basically adopting or possibly adopting the county's plan as the city's own. And data from this is gonna be, be able to parse out or the city's gonna be able to parse out West Lynn responses versus just the county. So it'd be really great if we got a lot of responses from people in West Lynn. If you wanna, get super nerdy on reduce, reuse, recycle. The master recycler program is the best program out there. Um, it hasn't been offered a number of years. So the wait list is crazy. It's crazy long before, it was crazy long before COVID. Now that it's back, the wait list is hundreds of people, but I would still sign up. There's a, an, a training going on in Washington County soon. Um, the Association of Oregon Recyclers and Oregon State host online Recycling 101, which is just a $35 training program. The Eat Smart Waste Less program is a bunch of awesome tips to help learn how to better prevent food waste. Because again, 
if you look at what we as individuals can do, re renewable energy, eliminate food waste, plant-based diet, electrify everything, that's going to get you, that's, if you're doing those things, you're doing really well. There's a lot of great plant-based eating resources, um, organizations that just kind of help educate on the benefits, um, but also even some out there like Forks Over Knives, which is all just about health and uh, even recipes. Uh, the Westland Library is a partner in the Library of Things, which you can borrow really cool items uh, from the library instead of just books. It's an awesome program. That When we talk about reduce and reuse, that's a really great example. Also, repair fairs, which Westland was a leader in and I think might be picking up. Well, no, Robin Wood's closed. I don't know. Either way, repair fairs are happening again. They're awesome. If you haven't been to one, just go check it out. We obviously have the Habitat Restore and the Rebuilding Center as well. Uh, construction materials are having an enormous impact and we really want to make sure that those get reused properly. So I'm, I'm really sorry that I had to just like blah, blah, blah through the last 15 minutes to get through it all. Um, if anybody wants to stick around, I'm content to stick around. I know Jerry probably just wants to dip, but um, I, can, I can wax unpoetic all night. I'm happy to stick around. I'm going to stop sharing. That was a lot of information barfed at you all. Um, any questions, concerns, slights? Hi, Debbie. Hey Alex, thank, thank you for sharing your expertise. Um, I, I'm trying to get my head around um, something that you kind of said. Um, it relates to the fact that recycling has a can have a fairly large carbon footprint also. So in terms of buying things that are made of recycled material may not necessarily mean that that's the right thing to do in terms of the environmental impact. I, am I correct along that line? what you said. I just want to make sure I'm understanding correctly. And then I'm trying to apply that to something that I'm doing in terms of, for example, I buy um, clothes that is made out of recycled material. So does that mean that I need to take a closer look at this because it may not be accomplishing what I want it to accomplish? Kind of, yeah. Um, so recycled content, if there's any um, attribute, environmental attribute that is probably going to be good, it's recycled content. So, um, but again, if you are making, especially if you're comparing different materials, so if you're picking recycled content, I mean, you're saying clothes, but um, if you're picking, let's say, recycled content, if you were a restaurant and you were deciding that you want to have your to-go containers be recycled content paper products because you want to do the right thing and you can't recycle a single use plastic, picking that recycled content paper container is extremely likely to actually have a worse overall impact from either climate and or pollution and or uh, um, natural resource depletion compared to a virgin single use plastic. I hate how much plastic we get as much as anyone else. But the thing is that it actually does a, a pretty good job. It does a really good job at a lot of things that we want it to do. Um, you know, sometimes people might think of the days in which you got meat from the butcher wrapped in paper um, as the, a great thing. And that's actually probably worse. Not probably, that's gonna be worse than even like the gnarly styrofoam stuff, but I don't want my food touching it regardless. But to, from an environmental perspective, um, picking recycled content may, if you're, if you're, it only matters if you're comparing the exact same material. So recycled content, I don't know, like what, what are the clothes made of? Like just like that fabric may be different. Um, okay. Okay. So for example, like if it was, um, if you're comparing um, material that is the same, like um, cotton versus a virgin cotton versus recycled cotton, then we can say that using something that's recycled cotton as opposed to virgin cotton would, 
we have a positive environmental impact in general. Probably. If, if we're talking about the same material. Yeah, because the only way that you could actually know the true environmental impact of your product was if you knew exactly where it came out of Earth, how it was processed, right, how it was turned right. into a product, how it was manufactured, how it was shipped, how it was stored. You have no way of figuring that stuff out. And so we get hung up on things like the best packaging or the best single use material as opposed to the big climate chunk stuff of food waste prevention, of advocating for renewable Kim has Kim has her little cartoon hand up for a bit. Um, but yeah, it's yeah, it's those buzzwords get a lot of interest and people you'll that's why you'll see, you know, I mean, Amazon started shipping a lot of items in non-recyclable plastic bags and stuff like that. And then uh consumers and customers threw a fit and said, we can't recycle this. And they say, We heard you. We're gonna go back to to cardboard boxes that can be recycled everywhere. The problem is that that cardboard box has a significantly bigger environmental impact, even if you recycle it compared to a single use plastic package. If you have an item and it can be, you can recycle it, by all means recycle it. There's a lot of third party recycling services out there that I think are a bunch of BS, but that's another topic. Okay, Kim, buddy, sorry. Okay, you know my favorite. <laughs> You know, Alex, my favorite answer is yes. And, and I have an amp for sand in my house and I'm in it, in it and I, I'm hearing the either or, and I understand that we're on a timeline and that's where we've put our efforts, you know, with the city's sustainability goals, because energy and transportation are some of the biggest creators of greenhouse gases and then seeing food waste here. Right. So I'm hearing about, you know, it's this is a this is a total cry bear baby session. I was super sad, and and I appreciate the bigger picture. But as a as a global leader, I just cringe every day of everything we buy is now with more plastic or now with more waste, now with more garbage. So even as our nation, if we just focus on the other measures it still influences island countries that don't have a place in their huck and bottles in the ocean. And we're still eating those same fish. So is there a better movement on the manufacturing? And cause we don't have control over what's hitting our shelves. Like I can go to the farmer's market. I can get strawberries in the container and take the thing back. That's awesome. But that's not practical on a day-to-day -day basis. So what measures are happening on that manufacturing end because it's it feels like we're taking 10 steps backwards every day on jacked up waste. Yeah. I mean you're you're preaching to the choir of the issues of this types of issues. I you know, I think you know Oregon's uh the bill that was passed last year that's looking at extended producer responsibility is an example of an approach in which like I said Producers are, they're foisting their way packaging that's also good for shipping, it also saves them a lot of money. So, and we are stuck to deal with it. Our, our, uh, our solid waste systems are dealing with it. We are subsidizing these companies' profits. They're saving money on us and then we're having to dispose of it. And yes, it is a human rights crisis when you're talking about, I mean, You've seen images of what it looks like in other countries. Some of the, some of that waste is us sending items that are not recyclable overseas. That's why China stopped taking the world's recycling. Um, but fill standards around the world, I guess. But a, there's a surprisingly large number of people around the world. The only way they can deal with their garbage is to just dump it or burn it or bury it. That's something that people are dealing with. Billions of people are doing every day. And yes, some of those manufacturers, I mean, obviously Coca-Cola sells everywhere. Coca-Cola's garbage is at the bottom of the ocean. Like there's some of those companies, but there's a lot of products in which it's, they're not always so global. And if you look at the Great Pacific uh, garbage patch, this isn't consistent with the rest of the ocean, but over half of that plastic waste is fishing material like fishing net and fishing lines. I mean, again, it's coming from low and middle income nations that rely on fishing for their livelihood. And it doesn't make a lot of sense to have to go then fish out your nets that are tangled up rather than just cut them loose. 
there's a lot. My my point is that there's a lot of these things we have to do, but but people think of think that recycling or that our own plastic bills are going to be improving ocean debris in a meaningful way. It's important to do. Any amount of litter is evil. But as far as a lever, as a tool, but it's, it's pointless if we cook in a couple of years and the ice caps melt. So I hear you. Well, and the other th other thing I think we have heard people complain because the you know, Oregon's uh, Recycling and Modernization Act that stuff doesn't kick in until twenty twenty five, and people are saying, well, it's twenty twenty two. I want to be dealing with this stuff now. Um, but it, I also think like, well, we're also talking about having to cut emissions by twenty thirty. That's eight years away. That to me is a timeline or a way more important timeline than how quickly we can deal with our clamshells. I mean, there's, you know, there's companies like TerraCycle, there are these third party recycling companies that are, I mean, it's, I mean, TerraCycle Terra it itself is, it's greenwashing. Like that one is sketchy as all hell, but there are other services which like it's great. better ways that we could address our biggest issues um, than via recycling. And I work in recycling all day. I've been locked in garbage enclosures. I'm a master recycler. I, oh, oh boy, I recycle. <laughs> My family recycles like crazy. But it, we gotta, we need to move the conversation up. I can't tell if Terry is, if that's your screensaver or if you're just really still, okay, it is you. No. <laughs> I'm mesmerized, Alex. <laughs> yeah. uh, Alex, I, I really do appreciate your massive reality check here. And I know all of us are gonna keep recycling, but to put those other issues in the forefront, I think is extremely important and I appreciate the information you gave us. Wondering if there are any other questions or comments from the crew. Okay. Oh, it's, it's Martin here. My video is off. Um, I, I, I sense in your voice the deep frustration about where we, where we are at and where we could be. And, and, and it seems to me that whatever steps we take as we can take them are good ones. And that we may not be able to chip away at this at this mountain except by tiny, tiny bits. And I don't know, but you know, everything that you're doing is terrific and everything that you're suggesting is terrific. Yeah. Victoria, go ahead. Well, I I think this is a really sobering discussion. Um, I, I learned a lot that I, I didn't know I needed to learn. Um, and it could be depressing, but if we can change our priorities and not obsess so much on uh, recycling and instead really work on the other things that have a, a, a zooming timeline here, then that's a good thing. Yeah, and the SAB has worked on, I mean, climate stuff for a long time, right? In the city, I think, unfortunately, people think that this, that there's not a, I get the the feeling that there's not a lot being done locally at either the county or the city level, but I mean, there's a, there's a lot of people doing a lot of good work around um, climate, and I don't know, I, I think working in, I have to, when I work in the field, I mean, like, if, if you're not up at night worrying about the climate crisis, I want to know what your secret is. Because, but at the same time, I'm with people who are dedicated and who are doing stuff. And that energizes me, you know, and that, because when you, and I think what's really important is that if you go through those climate trainings, which I really do recommend, it is Downerville for a long time because you, the amount of, inf I gave you no real background of uh, how severe the climate crisis is. So you have to sit through that stuff. But then eventually you learn about all these people around the world 
all these people that are dedicating their lives who aren't even responsible for the climate crisis from nations that didn't even put us here who are doing amazing stuff. And that is super inspiring. Um, and also just to learn. I mean, I think, you know, like if your beliefs and, and the reality don't line up, adjust your beliefs and just kind of learn and, and move on. Um, but I don't know, the SAB is doing a lot of great stuff. There was a project a number a few years ago now about a community solar project or about adding solar panels in some of the parks that was researched by some interns from, from Oregon Institute of Technology, which was a cool project. You know, the city is investing in wind power. Um, there's some cool stuff going from a climate perspective. We need, we do, we need to electrify. Like we need, we need way better EV infrastructure in our city, but you know what, you know, who's actually put them in the city. I mean, so it's kind of like, okay, cool. Well, who else can we, can we get to do this? Debbie. Debbie, go ahead. Um, I had a question, Alex. I was wondering if you could, um, Help me with something that I've been kind of struggling with um, in terms of electrifying. Um, you know, given that there is a carbon footprint associated with the production of new things, like for example, an electric car, there, you know, the, from extraction of material to manufacturing of it. So there's emissions associated with that. And then there's also a carbon footprint associated with recycling of, of for example, gas tools. Uh, gas cars and you know, the uh, transporting the gas stuff to recycling centers, uh, breakdown of the material, you know, all of that requires energy and there's emissions associated with that. So in terms of um, as, as I'm trying to move towards electrification, would it make more sense to kind of um, um, wait till, um, for example, a gas tool is closer to the end of its functional life before you buy something new, a new I, electric I, item. I mean, yeah, I, I got where you're going with it. Um, it's, gonna, it's going to depend, but my understanding of the research around that is that there are some items that you, there's a lot, there are a lot, are a lot of items that you wanna make last as long as possible bad but easy example a totally different side of the spectrum like a pair of shoes make your pair of shoes last but if you look at an ev versus a, a gas powered car or even a hybrid the research does show that from a climate perspective even buying a new ev because of the emissions saved while driving um, you would have to live in an area with an energy grid that is all coal to even have it come close. Meaning, or what I mean is that buying an EV compared, environmentally speaking, compared to a gas powered car is, is going to be a, a win. Tools, I honestly don't know. I, I would assume it's the same thing. I think a lot of those things are kind of like just having to research them in, individually. I mean, there's I mean, gas powered, you know, like uh, landscaping tools are a major source of emissions because of how little those emissions are actually kind of processed or filtered on their way out. Um, but those kinds of stuff, I, that's not an area I know a lot of, of about, but I have heard from people who specifically work in uh, the EV field who have this essentially said that switching to an EV compared to a gas powered or even a hybrid at any time is a carbon benefit. There are also gnarly batteries in EVs that, you know, like you kind of need, need to be mindful of as well. But from a climate perspective, my understanding is that EVs are a win no matter the state of your car. Doesn't mean you can afford them. Mm -hmm. But my wife and I got a, when we realized we had twins, we, we realized we had to become a, a minivan family. And we got a plug-in electric hybrid minivan bike and it's, it's electric range is 32 miles, which sounds like nothing, but that covers 98% of our drives. The only time that we have to refuel it is when it tells us that the gas is so old that we have to cycle through it. Otherwise, I think in the past two years, we would have refueled twice. Okay, thank you.
Oh, yeah. There's a fellow out in uh, Hillsboro who sells only used electric vehicles, Waterman Motors. It's useful. Yeah, yeah. And it, what's that? He has very little overhead because he just keeps them all in a warehouse and has one guy working there. So he has, he sells them for a lot less, like 20% less than other places. So it's possible to spend less on one. Yeah, and I've seen, um, I don't know what they're at now, but I've seen, you know, like Leafs, you know, the Nissan Leafs for not at all. I feel so privileged to say that, you know, under 10 grand is not a lot of money, but for a car, it's not a lot of money. Thank you, Alex and Terrence and, and um, Jerry and everybody else. I'm going to sign off now. Hey, thanks for showing up, Marty. Yeah, I'm sorry I had too many slides, and I'm sorry that I was having to wing it. It uh, uh don't worry about that. But, it was fine. Yeah. Sorry, Alex. A lot of good information. Really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Yeah. Any last questions from the remaining audience members? Okay. If not, Alex, thanks again. I really appreciate the information and. Uh, Overall, it may have been a downer, but on the upside, I think you gave us some good things to work for. So I appreciate it. That's good feedback that it's a downer because, <laughs> to, because to me, it's kind of like, okay, we have things that actually move the needle a lot. We should focus on that. Yeah. I don't know. I, 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 I'm a fan of the show Chopped, and I uh, do Chopped in my kitchen every night with a bunch of random weird ingredients that I have to make into something. <laughs> That's a good way to prevent food waste. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for showing up. Appreciate it again, Alex. And, uh, thank you, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jerry, I'll see you in like a day and a half. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye, y'all. Thank you.